All right, today's story comes from the BBC. We're taking a look at the Chinese uh, hemp farmers. We're putting that in air quotes because this story runs deep. Um, part entertaining, very informative, um, kind of uh, interesting as well with some of the legal loopholes. So we're going to dive into some illegal hemp farming on Native American land, how it was able to operate for three years as a cannabis uh, facility, and uh, how easy it was just to go from one location to another and start over. So all of that coming up and more. It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Head. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Back with us is Katrina Glogowski, Angel Investor and Attorney. Thanks for being back on The Talking Hedge. Thanks, Josh. Uh, this, this story threw me for a loop when I saw it. Very interesting. I'm glad you brought it to my attention. So um, why don't you take it away? This is again from the BBC called Chinese Dreams on Native American Land, a tale of a cannabis boom and bust. So let's start with uh, tribal property, uh, tribal reservations. Uh, the United States government and your county sheriff and the local police, uh, they do not have jurisdiction to go on to tribal land. So uh, that's the first point. The second point is if you are on tribal land and you are not a tribal member, uh, a member of the Navajo Nation, for example, the tribal police do not have jurisdiction over you. And so it creates this gray zone uh, on tribal lands. And so here we have uh, a, a very entrepreneurial minded individual. When the uh, 2018 farm bill passed, he approached tribal members to lease tribal land. He is not a tribal member. And he said, hey, I'm going to grow hemp here. And it was a small tribe. They did not have a, 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 farm, uh, a farm bill plan, a pilot program. So he created the farm board, appointed himself director of the farm board, and approved his own personal hemp growing plan. Uh, this was all out in the open. Uh, no, he was not underground or anything else. They had acres and acres and acres of covered um, outdoor greenhouses where these uh, migrant workers, primarily Chinese migrant workers, were coming and harvesting this product. And very few of the tri Chinese migrant workers spoke English. And hemp and cannabis is easily uh, confused from a visual perspective. And so all these Chinese migrants came to these reservations and started harvesting, growing, and, and tending to these ostensibly hemp crops. Well, turns out they were growing cannabis. And all the powers that be kind of knew about this. So they called the FBI and, and they're like, hey, they're growing cannabis out there. And the FBI said, tribal, tribal property can't do anything. They called the tribal, um, the, the tribal police and they say, hey, they're growing cannabis out there. And they're like, well, you know, uh, we really can't do anything. <laughs> so it took years, Josh, years for the authorities to develop a workaround to be able to uh, address this situation. Meanwhile, the Chinese migrants were, were continuing to work on the farm and um, uh, weren't necessarily well cared for, shall we say. And so the, the federal government, uh, the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, the FBI, the local DEA office, uh, the sheriffs, the police, and the tribal police I'll go in and um, and raid these raid these farms. Uh, guess what? <laughs> it was the migrant workers who got arrested, uh, and the migrant workers who were like, "Oh, you're playing with cannabis without a without a, a license, so you're you're committing federal crimes." Uh, and the individual who masterminded it uh, wasn't there the day that they uh, raided it, and so life is fine. 
Fast forward just a few scant months, this very entrepreneurial minded individual relocated to Oklahoma and did the exact same thing in Oklahoma. And the whole point of the BBC's article was that basically the Chinese migrant workers that were working on the first tribal reservation just relocated to Arizona and started doing it all over again. And in fact, many of the migrant workers who were interviewed for this article said it was the best job that they ever had. And that's why they wanted to go to Oklahoma to continue to quote unquote, cut flowers, Josh. Yeah, so let's let's break that down a little bit because that whole thing, I've got a lot of questions. I'm sure a lot of people do as well. So um, first off, it, it kind of only highlights Idaho's paranoia of medical marijuana versus hemp and the inability to tell the difference. Um, many, many people, maybe the majority of people wouldn't be able to tell the difference if one was put right next to the other. Uh, and so for years, this kind of went on, whereas people in the know, like you mentioned, they, they knew, they knew what was up. Um, so having said that, you, you got you to gotta peel back some layers here, because how in the hell can, can the FBI and the Native American police force and no one really have jurisdiction or authorization or the ability to do anything? So essentially, and, and we're not experts in this by any stretch, but essentially from what we can gather, the FBI couldn't go in there because it's Native American land and they didn't have authorization at all. Correct. The, Native American local police couldn't do anything because the individuals growing weren't Native American. Correct. So, so they licensed the land from Native Americans, but they themselves weren't Native Americans. Therefore, they are exempt somehow from Native American law, I guess. That's, that's pretty weird. It, uh, exemption is a strong word, Josh. Um, basically, uh, there, there was multiple overlays here. It did occur on tribal land, so you would expect the tribal police to have jurisdiction. If you've ever driven through the painted desert and got a speeding ticket from a tribal cop, they have jurisdiction uh, on tribal land, even though you're not a tribal uh, member. Uh, but then the land, the farmland itself was owned by tribal members, but the individuals operating the, uh, the farm were not. And of course, the, the migrant labor that was physically performing the work were not. But what crime was being committed? Um, they had a lease. They were openly doing this and ostensibly under a, an approved hemp pilot program and they were growing hemp. And what is your what is your basis for going in there and testing it? Uh, well, it's cannabis. Well, how do you know it's cannabis looking at it from the street? You, you don't, you have to test it. Okay, well, in order to test it, you need a warrant. Uh, so what's your basis uh, for claiming that you need a warrant? Um, I'm sure it's a lot deeper than that uh, because it does seem like they got away with it for an extended period of time. But that's basically what happened. Uh, it was a game of who's on first, um, who has jurisdiction here, who needs to get the warrant and who needs to take action. And there was a dispute between the various agencies of, of um, who, has authority here and that's why they get got away with it for so long and yet the only reason they had to relocate from new mexico to oklahoma and start this whole process over again is because the employees got arrested not i mean the, the operation didn't get shut down the equipment didn't get confiscated the individuals doing it weren't prosecuted nothing um so the individuals were harassed and essentially let go and said, you know, I didn't know this was illegal. How would I know? All there's all this capital. We're in the open. I love what I do. By the way, they get paid what five dollars an hour in New Mexico to cut flowers, and it's the best job they've ever had. <laughs> it was there was a comment similar to that in the article. Yes, uh, they were happy. It was easier work than picking strawberries or lettuce or 
or something else. They were able to sit down and cut flowers. Right. And so again, they're the only ones that were, were arrested. So um, maybe it's still going on in Oklahoma. I don't know, but um, yeah, maybe inspiring for other native American tribes to, to, to get started because clearly the regulations are different. They can kind of do what they want. Apparently that's my takeaway. <laughs> uh, yeah, honestly, this really is an example of, of a perfect storm. You have an individual who not only took advantage of the gray area, but knew how to take advantage of the gray area. And that was one of the reasons that the migrant labor force really wasn't criminally prosecuted for this because it was out in the open. Uh, that no one was hiding this. It, it, they were out there harvesting cannabis unknowingly. Um, you can argue that too, uh, <laughs> but uh, they did argue, you know, cannabis is uh, just unheard of in, in China, uh, certainly not uh, a common plant that individuals would run into. And again, visually, uh, hemp and cannabis can be quite confusing. Um, but there one of the things that the article didn't address is what they did with this tons of cannabis that basically flooded the black market because it was not legal. You weren't going to get your little barcode and enter it into the metric database or leaf set or anything, headset. So they, they basically had an illegal grow operation right under the noses out in the open for years uh, and then they just moved. Yeah, well, Oklahoma's medical market just got a lot cheaper after this move. So yeah, it did. <laughs> people in New Mexico are going to wonder why the prices are going up after this this uh, this exodus out of there because that was a lot of product over three years where they had to um, get through a medical market that doesn't have as many regulations, so they don't have to go across state lines. So the FBI doesn't get brought in on that aspect. Uh, mm -hmm. They're able to keep it within uh, within the market and um, and keep it quasi legal to the point where you know they 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 know what they're doing. So um, my big takeaway from this is that the the Native American tribes need to work together. They need to start rolling cannabis. Uh, blunts, whether that's hemp or tobacco, they'll be the only ones uh, in maybe possibly North America to be able to combine tobacco and cannabis. If you're not into tobacco blunts, uh, I don't care. <laughs> it's an option. They can do hemp, mint, uh, unbleached natural white paper or tobacco, whatever. There is a market for it. That's my point. And the opportunity here is, um, is em endless. And with this as an example of, of being able to circumnavigate federal laws, I would take full advantage of first mover advantages while to, uh, big tobacco is already on the prowl. We've seen that, we've covered that on the podcast recently and uh, huge opportunities. So rather than being taken advantage of, I'd like to see Native Americans uh, use this to their advantage. So uh, interesting story, Katrina, any last thoughts? When there's a will, there's a way, uh, right? Uh, this, this, in a way, the 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 guy who did this uh, um, gets a thumbs up. Um, but the effect that that this one individual had on this reservation, uh, the article shows pictures because they just left. They left in the middle of the night, um, and it, it, the, their property is destroyed. There's trash and debris everywhere um it, it's it's not cool and and as an advocate for legalized cannabis this is an example of what can go horribly wrong mm -hmm. yeah uh, lots of options. You know, these these tribes can create a um, tribal tokenized asset utilizing a rolling machine as collateral. There's a lot of rolling machine options. You can contact me for that for pre rolls or joints or blunts or whatever. Um, but yeah, um, come together, unite, create an opportunity out of this and uh, push forward and move forward because that is a massive opportunity that I'm seeing uh, with tribes rather than being taken advantage of. So hopefully they uh, start moving on that. I'd like to follow up. Hopefully they do something. 
you have to come back to the talking hedge and find out with that. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Golgowski, angel investor and attorney. Thanks again for being on the talking hedge. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is the talking hedge. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.